house to home. Presented by Remax Diamond Realty. All right, everybody. House to home is here. Only Liz. So I have uh, all of her institutional knowledge all to myself this week. And uh, you know what? We've been talking for the last couple of weeks about multiple offers and really understanding the true value of a deal. What's on the table? How can you make it work for you, either from a buyer's perspective? But Liz, this week, we're going to talk about multiple offers from a seller's point of view. And necessarily, if a potential buyer comes up to you and says, okay, I understand you've got all of these bidders and they're working with the bank and you know uh, they're trying to close their, their deals and everything like that. I've got cash in hand. I've either got a thick roll of US currency. I've got all of these bills in front of me and everything like that. Go ahead and count it. Or I can cut you a cashier's check today. What do you want to do? Is is it that cut and dry and, and that easy to make a decision? And, and if you have cash in front of you, as opposed to other people trying to get a loan, should you jump at that deal? Is that just smart business? Well, our, our obligation as realtors is to submit all offers and um, cash, bank loan, partial cash, whatever offer we get, we're obligated to present all offers and put it on the table. Now, a seller, uh, if we represent the seller, they'll ask us some questions and we present it. Sometimes you'll get multiple cash offers, plus we'll get offers from um, buyers that are getting the bank loan. Now, um, you know, the bank loan, of course, takes 45 to 60 days for them to complete. And usually they include uh, contingencies such as inspection, um, survey, different things. Whereas sometimes a cash buyer may require that as well, but their window of time to close would be let's say 10 days or 15 days or 20 days. It's all subject to what contingencies they put you know, in their offer. So I just feel bad that when you have 20, as Gina puts it last week, over 20 offers or 10 offers, and let's say, for example, we're representing one of the buyers that are getting a bank loan. Um, I always would tell my buyers that, yes, we've got a good offer, and they, the buyer themselves, may go above asking price. Uh, and of course, we hope it appraises, or that buyer has to be prepared to pay the difference between the appraisal and the purchase price. But I always tell them, if a cash offer comes in, you have to be prepared that should that offer be stronger and above whatever the price is, you know, they have the tendency to lean towards that. Now, it may be a little different if let's say, Jason, you submitted an offer to me and you're a good friend, I know your dad, John, and I have, and you're getting a loan. So the, so the party party have, system, basically. Yes, and a party system. Yeah. But I might have a, um, a good relationship with your dad that I might give you more consideration. That's a, a seller's prerogative. So if for some reason your offer may be a little less than a cash offer, but the relationship is stronger than the money, then I might say, I'd rather take Jason's offer because his dad and I are good friends. Therefore, that's where I'm going. And that kind but of thing happens all the time, especially here on Guam. Yes, yes. And it's always the seller's prerogative uh, to make the decision on which offer to accept. Um, you know, we can't dictate that. Our job as realtors would be to present everything, answer whatever questions they have, and then go from there. Right. You're but not making the decision for, for the seller. You're just like sifting and, and diluting and um, dissecting, if you will, all the things and saying, okay, this is right. the way you probably should go. The decision is ultimately up, up to the seller. And I, I would even dare say it's probably in the seller's position at that point, how badly do they need to make money that fast? They may say, <laughs> hey, um, I'm trying to send my kid to college, you know, within the next three months, I've got some debt I'm trying to clear off my books. I've got, you know, whatever, it's, as opposed yeah, to it's it being subject, a long-term thing. It's subject to what their motivation, if they're motivated to sell. And sometimes sellers have, like you said, they're leaving Island, their kids are going to college. Right. That might drive the decision even more, um, or they're on the verge of foreclosure. So they may want to gravitate to grabbing what they can as quick as possible, especially if the timeline uh, is limited. 
But, you know, I, again, I feel bad that when you receive so many offers, people are looking for homes. However, their offer may not be as strong as a cash offer. So it behooves all of us to say, hey, Jason, you're putting in this offer. Let's cross our fingers and pray that your offer get accepted because you have a 60 day window to close. It's subject to appraisal, subject to inspection, subject to boundary points, you know, all of those. But even with that, sometimes a buyer will say, okay, forget that. It's not, and I had a buyer that say, it's not subject to appraisal. It's not subject to survey, no contingencies. And they were willing to pay out of pocket. And even that offer, and they, you know, they were going to pay over a hundred thousand out of their pocket. And even that offer got beat because a wow. cash offer came in, you know, quick and easy closing. Okay. So here's something, <laughs> and you, you have always said that the three most wonderful words or the three most damning words, depending on how you look at it in real estate deals are cash is king, right? Realistically speaking in, in the real market, as it stands today on Guam, how often does somebody come to the table when you say you have multiple offers for the same piece of property and say, I've got cash in hand, let's do this. Is it really that frequent? Is it, is this something that as a potential seller, I really need to keep it, keep an eye on? So far the past offers we've been making their cash offers. And I just put up a listing today and the, what the first response we're showing, we have a cash buyer. So I know are these already, institutional investors? Are these people that you know have like inheritances or you know family members pass away and they come upon a large sum of money? That are, these are investors. There's a there's a couple of uh, type buyers buyers that want to occupy, mm. and they've been putting in offers that they keep getting beat out of. So now they're making an effort um, to use the cash to buy, and then we have investors that want to use the property to rent. You know, right now, our rental market uh, for Section 8 has gone up. You could rent a three bedroom for around 2000 something. And um, military tenant base rent is 2200 So if you're targeting those markets, it makes it a good investment to buy rental, uh, to buy property so that you can use it as rental property. But the key on that is just don't buy any location. You want to pick a property that is suitable that you know it will attract both, you know, Section 8 tenants or um, military tenants. Okay, and now to be fair though, but from the flip side of the coin, from the from the perspective now, if we can, Liz, of somebody who may be submitting a cash offer, if you have the ability to do that, you've got a hell of a lot of flexibility. I think like you can always say, "I've got cash in hand." you know what, something bigger, better came along, or, you know, I just got cold feet, or, you know, I changed my mind, or I was sympathetic to somebody else wanting to get this because the guy knew me. And like, again, you said, it may be my cousin, it may be my classmate, mm -hmm. you know, he said, you know, his kids really love the house, I'm just going to pull my offer. And now I've got cash on hand for the next thing that might come across the table, right? Is that, is that correct? That's right. That's okay. right. Because usually as an investor, we want to keep the cash to do renovations. And we try to do loan. We try to get a loan because then the cash we can utilize for other down payments for other investments and then get a loan. But nowadays we're seeing if they don't put the cash forward, they might not get the deal. So catch 22. You know? So how as a potential buyer, can I put myself in possibly the best and most flexible position, which is to have a massive amount of cash on hand? Is there anything I can, I can uh, leverage? as far as my cash well, position with the bank or as well, a, your cash position, your edge, let's say there's, helps two to be rich. Cash, there's two or three cash buyers. The edge with that, your edge would be no contingencies, no appraisal, no boundary points inspection. You mm -hmm. take it at is you go and you eyeball the property just to make sure you have an idea. Um, so as this condition, no contingencies, then you're on, you're up there, you're up there on the list in terms and of course price is a factor so if the property is asking 200 and you're offering 150 i don't care how much cash you've got if you offered 150 your chances of getting it is slim right so if you offer asking price or above asking price then you would be right up here in terms of the possibilities of getting the offer wow well that's our episode for this week everybody and like liz says you know take away from this episode cash is king Long live the king. Forever may he reign. <laughs>
<laughs> Absolutely. Let's get that economy back. Liz, thank you so much. Appreciate it as always. You're welcome. And I love that All shot right. of Tuman, Tuman Bay. <laughs> All right, everybody. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you next time. Cash is king. Bye.